If you have your Bibles this morning, open it up to the book of Acts in the New Testament, um, to Acts chapter 4. Uh, if you're using the Bible of the chair you, it's going to be about two-thirds of the way through there. Um, it's in the New Testament. Uh, if you're using your phone, it's going to be whatever three or four clicks it takes you to get there. So, uh, But we're going to be in Acts chapter 4. We began the series of looking at the life of the early church of this uh, a movement of people that started with, with Jesus calling 12 men. Uh, that turned into 72 people being sent out to declare the kingdom of God while Jesus was here on this earth, and 120 waiting in a room after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected, waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit, and that 120 people then going into the city of Jerusalem and then to the um, furthest ends of the world, so that we have the opportunity to be people of faith here today, that our story ties right back to God's story of what he was unfolding in that time. And underlined in this series as we're looking through the book of Acts is this question, does Jesus still matter today? Is there still power in the name of Jesus in the world and in the life that we live, even though we're 2,000 years removed, even though technologically we're in a totally different place, even though there are seem to be more languages and more cultures and and more challenges and more issues and all kinds of things that, that can tend to, in our minds, to separate us from that time. But does Jesus still make a difference? And so we're looking at this through our heart of opening up our heart and our minds to say, Jesus, would you speak to us and show us your reality in our world today? And then as we come into Acts chapter 4, it's really a continuation of a story that began previously where Peter and John, as they were going into the temple in order to worship and to tell people about Jesus, that they encounter a man who had been paralyzed, uh, that was deformed and was unable to walk since um, he was born. For as we see in this story for over 40 years, that he was a beggar who, who sat on the, on the steps, dependent upon other people's generosity and kindness. And Peter and John, as they go by this man, that, that Peter speaks to him and that there's this miraculous healing that takes place as Peter calls upon the name of Jesus and commands the man to stand up and to walk. And, then, and this miracle takes place in this moment. And the man is just ex ex exuberant, extraordinarily happy. He's jumping up and down. He's leaping. He's praising God. He is over the top. As you can imagine, you would be if you had been crippled and unable to walk since you were born, and now all of a sudden your legs work just fine, you would be exercising them and your voice in great measures, and that was what was taking place here. And so a crowd gathers around Peter and John, um, and they began to, to speak and to tell about this great thing that, that has happened, and in what name that this has happened. And we pick up the story here in Acts chapter 4, because what is now taking place is, is that we see that there is a collision and a clash of convictions and beliefs, a clash and a crash of, of truth, ultimately. And there are these beliefs that are being challenged by what Peter and John both exhibit and what they proclaim about who Jesus is and the powers and the authorities within that time. And any time that we begin to talk about Jesus in the world, and this has always been the case, any time that Jesus enters into culture, enters into life, not everybody is interested in hearing what Jesus has to say or who Jesus is. Has anybody ever experienced that in your life? So that you begin to, to show and to share and to uh, exhibit the life of Jesus in the world, that not everybody is really excited about that. Not everyone wants to seek truth. And here we see this collision and this clash of power, political and religious power, versus the power of truth that is on the side of Peter and John up against this political and religious power and authorities that are here. So if you look at Acts chapter 1, let me read to you Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. And, and what we see here is, is that Peter and John, again, they're sharing, and, and the, the Sadducees were, were one of the major religious parties of the day. They, had, uh, they were uh, the, the primarily made up of the wealthy and the famous. That sort of sounds familiar in all in the world that we live in today. Is that those who have wealth, those who have fame, uh, there's sort of this group, and there is power that is that is there, and it was also connected to their religious beliefs within the Jewish one of the Jewish sects. And the Sadducees, in particular, did not believe in the resurrection of any kind. Of, regardless of what Jesus was going on here, is that that was one of the fundamental things. Because the idea of a resurrection was, was, was there within Jewish thought and Jewish belief. In fact, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but it was more of a theoretical idea uh, of, of, of that, that possibility out there. It wasn't sort of a practical reality that they saw. And so the Sadducees, when Peter and John began to speak about the resurrection of Jesus, that he had been resurrected, it annoyed them, and, it, and then Peter and John annoyed them, and Jesus was, was annoying to them. And so, because they had power and authority, they arrested Peter and John. At the, it was at the end of the, the day, remember they were going to prayer when this all broke out, which was about three in the afternoon. And so, it was illegal to hold a trial at night, um, even though they did it against Jesus. Uh, they did follow their rules at this point, so they put Peter and John in jail for that night until they could then in the next day have a trial uh, and, and try them for the things that they were saying. But yet, you see again this contrast that we will constantly see in the book of Acts is that you have some people, when they hear the name of Jesus, that all it does is it, it irritates them and annoys them, but then you have other people who they respond in belief and faith. And that's what you see in verse 4. It says that but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So in very short order, you have, you have 120 goes to 5,000, and it says here men, so that there would also be women and children that are, are going to be a part of this, this, this growing movement of faith and of belief in Jesus, uh, which is also something that can be very threatening to those who have power and control. Jesus is irritating. Have you ever done that in your life? My, my kids uh, um, accused me of doing clickbait, you know, sort of on the title of the sermon today of Jesus was annoying, right? It's like, ah, oh, Dad, you're just, you know, getting people to come. I didn't put it out there. So, um, but Jesus, this is what the story says, is that Jesus annoyed them. That Jesus is... Is irritating. Uh, I, I learned that just uh, yesterday at men's breakfast, uh, Dwight was sharing a bit of his story that I uh, irritated uh, Dwight a number of years ago, where I asked him the question, so what is the Lord teaching you? Um, because for him in that period, you know, in, in that season of his life, that there were some things going on, and, and he, it just was sort of an irritating thing, a question that happened. And, and here's the thing, is, is that when we are living our life out for Jesus, sometimes we just don't even know what we're doing because God is working in another person. And when they begin to see Jesus, it's not us that they're reacting to, it is God that they're reacting to. It is Jesus and his work and his spirit's work. And that's what's going on here. And I think that, you know, behind this question, what's the Lord teaching you? If you aren't being challenged in your thinking and your living, if you aren't being challenged in your thinking and your living, if you aren't growing, in other words, because that's of what growth is, is that, that, that we are, are stretched, we are challenged in how we are seeing things and how we are reacting and acting in life. If you aren't growing in your life, you're not paying attention to the Spirit of God speaking into your life. I'm, re I'm really con convinced of that. And I think that there are seasons where, where the Holy Spirit um, is can tend to be more encouraging to us, and we need those, those, those seasons of encouragement where we're uh, drawing us along. But there are other seasons where the, the Spirit of God is challenging us because the, 
the habits and the actions and the beliefs and the thoughts that we have, that we've developed, are not in line with God's thoughts, in God's truth, in God's actions for us. And so we face those points of tension. And this is the problem, so-called problem with Jesus, right? Is that Jesus loves you too much to leave you where you are. Have you ever sort of thought, Jesus, would you leave me alone? You know, I think that, you know, I, I, I said the prayer, you know, I, I do the, the, the Jesus things, the religious things, but just, just sort of back off, leave me alone. I think I just want to coast, you know, in my faith. I just want to coast in my life. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> like, oh, come on. Have you ever been there? I've been there. Jesus loves you too much to leave you alone. See, because the best life that you can possibly live is a life that is deeply connected to Jesus. The best life that anybody can live is a life that is deeply connected to Jesus. And that deeply connected life to Jesus is a, a life where we have to grow into that. And Jesus draws us closer to uh, to him, not because he doesn't like us, but because he loves us. He loves you. Now, central to the conflict was the resurrection of Jesus that we see here. And, and, and it brings up a, a really important point, is, is that you can't have biblical Christianity without the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So the point of contention here was is that Peter and John were preaching this message that yes, Jesus had been crucified. Yes, Jesus had been killed. Everybody agreed with that. Everybody in, in this story, they all knew that that was true. What Peter and John then were going and saying is, is that, that it didn't stop there. That Jesus is now bodily alive. That you will not find his body. That he was raised from the dead. And still today, in the world, the resurrection of Jesus is the point of contention. That Jesus is alive. When I was going to Oregon State University, I was taking some religious courses, religion courses, really great guys, wonderful people, um, but they didn't believe in the, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. It, it was a, it was a, there was a spiritual Jesus. And, and, and I remember them saying, I said, yeah, you know, that someday, you know, they can find the bones of Jesus. That is not biblical Christianity. That is not the story of the, the, these first apostles. That is not the story of the book of Acts. The story of the book of Acts is really clear. It is that Jesus, in his bodily form, is alive. That you will never find him. In all, in, in, in wherever you look. And so for the Sadducees who didn't believe in resurrection at all, that was a, a huge challenge. For the Pharisees who saw it as a, a sort of theoretical idea, it was a problem. And it's ultimately, um, there was a power conflict that was going on. And that's what we see is, is this power uh, and authority conflict happen. It's this question of, of uh, for us as followers of Jesus, well, where is our power? Where does our power come from? Because Peter and John were called to be in front of a very intimidating audience. In, in verses 5 through 7, it says, On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or what name did you do this? What I find is, is that I find that we're easily intimidated by those that we worship. You're like, ah, I don't worship anybody. Really? If, if you were, uh, if, if there was a story, a news story here recently where LeBron James, uh, who's a famous basketball player, and uh, Rajon Rondo, who's also, they both play for the Lakers, they went to a Duke game. Duke is like number one in the, in the nation and number two in the nation in, in 
college basketball. And they're talking about this, were you intimidated by you know, these great people, these great basketball players, and they're like, oh, we had to focus on our game. And, and when you're around these people of celebrities, like the Kardashians, right? What have the Kardashians done, right? I mean, they, they wear lots of makeup, and they you know, take pictures, and they post themselves on social media. And, but people get around them, and are like, whoa, you know, I can't talk, I can't say anything like that. You are worshiping those people. And, and within this culture that is going on here, there were these political powers, these religious powers. And if you got everybody in a room, it's like us going before a Senate you know, committee or whatever, and, and, or coming before the Supreme Court. Can you just sort of imagine that setting? where you have all these you know, men and women in black robes who look very serious up there staring down at you, and you're in, you know, this little person sitting in a chair, and you feel like you're sitting in a child's chair, right? You know, looking up to them. That's sort of the picture going on here. It's all about authority and power, and they're looking down Peter and John and saying, by what name have you done this? And in that, in that moment, there is this contrast of real power and true power. So because in verse 8, it says that, that Peter was empowered, and he was empowered by the power of the name of Jesus. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and the elders, if we were being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let me know to all you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Did you see that right at the beginning? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he speaks. It's really easy, I think, when we read about to forget that these guys that we're talking about were 20 something. The scholars believe that, you know, those first disciples, that they were, you know, in their late teens, early 20s, that when they started following Jesus, these are, these are young men. And they're called in front of a group of a bunch of old guys, because those are the ones who held the power and the money and the authority. Some things never change, right? And called to account... And Peter, in that context, is filled with the Holy Spirit and says to them, rulers of the people and elders. And the other thing about it is, is that we see here is, is that, the, that love has a name. There's a song by that. There's a worship song by that name. Love has a name. It's such a great song. And and I really find it interesting that what Peter doesn't do here is that he doesn't take the safe route. He doesn't say, well, God, you know, or higher power was engaged or involved in this. Now, I know that, you know, the term higher power in a lot of recovery processes and groups, that that's the name for it. And I'm not trying to make fun of anybody in their journey. But I will say to you is, is that when we say God or we say higher power, we're choosing a safe route because we have power over those names to define what they are and who they are and what they mean. Peter did not say God did this. That would have been the safe answer, perhaps negotiable with the powers confronting him in the moment. Peter he boldly proclaimed it was the name of Jesus of Nazareth through which this healing took place. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I mean, he, he could not have been more clear about where this healing took place. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, also from the city of Nazareth. Because again, sort of that last name thing wasn't the common within there. It would have been a father's name, but or also the location of which where they lived, where they were, were born. And so Peter is making really clear: Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It was through his name that this healing took place. There was no way to be confused about who he was talking about. 
And what Peter does in the initial story where he calls upon the name of Jesus to heal this man, and he comes back to this when he is called to account, is, is that he's saying to us today, is, is that we need to call upon the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That it is his name has power in life. Yesterday at the men's breakfast, um, Dwight, uh, hi Dwight, uh, I told him, he said, you can tell that story. He says, oh, it's too long. He says, okay, well, I'm going to tell the story. So he was telling the story that um, last June, uh, on a Sunday morning, he woke up and he, uh, when he opened his eyes, his eyeballs uh, did not coordinate. They were going all different directions. And he uh, had a stroke, uh, when it ultimately came to be found out. He had a stroke in the sort of close to the brain stem in the pons part of the brain, um, and it took him a long time to, to try to figure that out. And anybody who knows what that you know having a stroke, I mean that's not a small thing. And, and Dwight had actually had one before, uh, so he knew sort of what what the, the battle was a few years before. And so I had gone down there and um, and prayed over Dwight, and I brought some oil and anointed him with oil because the Bible tells. Uh, so, you know, if anybody's sick, to anoint them with oil, and elders come together and lay hands on them and pray for them uh, for healing. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, well, we're just going to do what the Bible says. And we, you know, the group of us gathered around, we prayed over Dwight. And and that was sort of the end of my story in that. And, and, and I knew that Dwight, you know, pretty soon got out of the hospital, and pretty soon was home, and I'd heard a story about, you know, that um, the physical therapist had come to the house and immediately left because they were, he was like, you don't need any physical therapy. There's nothing, I mean, what, what's wrong with you? And so Dwight was filling in the story that within two days, um, he was home after that. And a day of that was trying to convince the doctors that he was okay, right? That he should go home, that everything was fine. And anybody who's been around a stroke or uh, had a stroke, you know that that's, that's highly unusual. That, you, yeah, that doesn't happen. And, and Dwight was at the point where he uh, crawled, crawled out to his car that morning in order to get to the, the hospital. Um, he couldn't stand up. And so here we are a couple, uh, three days later, that he's home and the, and the physical therapist comes and says, I can't, you don't need anything. You don't need what I have because you're fine. And, and Dwight's like, that's the power of God that worked in my life. It brought to mind that a number of years ago that there was a woman, Faye, who had, um, um, had, was having some medical issues. There was an MRI, there was a mass in her brain. And so we, she asked for prayer, and we went to my office, and a group of us laid hands on her, we anointed her with oil, we prayed. And she went back for further tests, and the mass was gone. And I think about, um, I think about Rick, who we, uh, this is a few years back, where we were having a prayer gathering together, and uh, Rick had had some severe uh, back issues. He had been in the military for his career and really abused and used his body in that um, in his role there. And I just felt compelled to go over at, at the end of that time and to lay hands upon him and to pray that God would heal him. And so we gathered around him and, and I asked permission. I said, can we pray for you? And we, we prayed for him. And, and that, for, again, for me, the that was sort of the end of the story, but he told me later, he said that there was a warm sensation went through his body and, and his back was healed. Right. Where he had had these issues. In, in every one of those, the commonality was not me. The commonality was the name of Jesus. The commonality was coming to Jesus and saying, there is power in the name of Jesus world that we live in, in our lives, and, and that we call upon the name of Jesus when we have a need. With, the, with, with that power, though, is this challenge, and Peter makes it really clear, and it's, it's one of the annoying things about Jesus in the world today. Is, is that there is no other name that has that power. That 
praying in the name of Buddha, they're praying in the name of Muhammad, they're praying in the name of a Hindu god, of praying in the name of Joseph Smith, of praying in the name of David Cook, in the praying in the name of whatever name you want to choose. There is no other name that has that power. In Acts 4, 11 and 12, it says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And let's not get lost on the story of this man that was healed, uh, that had been paralyzed or uh, unable to walk for over 40 years. That the purpose of that was not his physical healing. The end goal purpose of that was is that he would experience the power of God that was the ultimate power of God was his salvation. Was that he would be saved. The challenge of Jesus in our culture today, as it was over 2,000 years ago, is, is that Jesus is uncompromising in who he is and what he came to do and the need that we have to respond to this. Jesus is uncompromising. That there is only one name. It is in the name of Jesus. And and let's also understand this. It's because he loves us. It's because he loves you. I mean, talk to any parent, right? Any parent that loves their children does not say, hey, do whatever you want. Uh, Three-year-old, I'm going to be gone for you know a few hours. Uh, there's stuff in the refrigerator. Just sort of figure it out. You can do whatever you want. It'll be fine. Just make sure you clean up after yourself, all right? You know? Uh, teenager, you know, hey, uh, have your boyfriend spend the night. You know, it's fine. You guys can stay in the same room. It's okay. Just, you know, just do whatever you want. It's going to be, it, it'll be okay. There's no parent that will do that to their kids that truly loves them and care for them. In fact, the people who don't do that, who do those things that I have shared with you, they are in the headlines. And why is that? Because as a parent, you love your children and you want what is best for them and you know more than they do, even though they don't believe that. <laughs> and also because you've made some pretty stinking mistakes in your life and you know the pain of those mistakes. And you don't want them to experience that as well. You love them. Jesus loves you. The best life possible is the life all of Jesus. These disciples, the power that they had came from being with Jesus. It was this that changed them. It says in verses 13 and 14, now when when these religious authorities in power saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. It is so important for you to understand that the life of following Jesus is not for the professionals. It's not for the people who have the, the title of pastor that gets put in front of their name. It's not for the ones who went to Bible school or to seminary. The life of the power of Jesus is for the followers of Jesus. Every one of us. The requirements, this will be really good for you to write down if you're taking notes. The requirements to be empowered and used by the Spirit of God in the world are this. Okay, you ready? Okay, this is a really important list. Okay. Number one, follow Jesus. That's it. All right? No more. There's not two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Follow Jesus. If you want to have power and you want to be used by God in the world, there is one requirement. Follow Jesus. The stories that I have to tell, the stories that I told you already, they come from a life that increasingly I try to say yes to Jesus. 
And if the Spirit of God sort of prompts me to do something, I, I try to say yes to that. Like running, you know, this is a while ago, running uh, on the trail, an Eldorado trail. No other person around. There's a woman walking the other way. She's deep in thought, pensive. I'm running the other way. I feel the Holy Spirit say, you need to turn around and go back and tell her that I love her. And I'm like, that is weird, Jesus. <laughs> and we're out here on the trail by my, ourselves. I am not an intimidating, unintimidating person. And I've already run by her. And now I'm going to run back to her. Be up, up behind her, and I'm going to say, excuse me, uh, Jesus wanted want me to tell you that he loves you. Yes. And so that's what I did. And I'm like, I know this might sound weird. I gave her lots of space. I said, but I just felt compelled to tell you that Jesus loves you and cares for you in your life. She's like, oh, thank you so much. That's so sweet. And then I started running again. Sometimes saying yes to Jesus is a weird thing. <laughs> But saying yes to Jesus comes from believing the scriptures. The believing that what the Bible says is true, even though I don't always understand it. And then trusting the scriptures. The reason that I pray for people for healing is because the Bible has said to do it and has said that God works through which is the, the last thing in this is that the stories where the stories come from is that I'm okay with the mystery of God more and more in my life. Because there have been other people I've prayed in the name of Jesus and they have not been healed. But I'm okay with that. Because it's not me. It's God. There's a higher authority that the disciples were following. That, that ultimately what we see here is there's an earthly power has to submit to a heavenly authority that truth wins. Because this, these, these authorities, they come to Peter and John and they say, don't tell anybody. Don't talk about this. Don't do this anymore. And, and it, they had to have like puffed their chest out, right? You know, uh, looked, you know, try to look, you know, stern and intimidating and mean and all that type of thing. And, and Peter and John answered to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, but, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They, they very nicely said, uh-uh, I don't care. We have to speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. And then Peter and John, they go back into their community. You know, last week I said, you know, it's not about the church, that we lead with Jesus, but I am a firm, firmly committed to the church, to the body, to, to the, the community of believers. And that's where Peter and John went back to, is this, the, the strength and the comfort of community. So in verse, four, uh, verse 23, it says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had to say to them. And in this, we get this picture of what community provides for us, why it's so critically important that we engage in community, that we come together like we're doing this morning, but even more importantly, I think, that we gather in those small groups of where, where we can be known and know others. And Peter and John go back, and, and they share this story, and, and within that, they were able to get perspective. They were able to retell the story of what had happened to them and then this group of friends that they went to, they broke out in prayer. It says, and when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. And in, the, in their prayer, they immediately turned to the truth of Scripture. And it's truth that they were reminding themselves of in this conflict, in this situation that they found themselves in. In verse 28, it says, but everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will in their prayer to God. Is that they're recognizing God, you have a plan in this, and we can trust you in this. And then they were encouraged. Verses 29 to 30 says, And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus.
at the end of this story uh, here, there's a contrast that takes place. If you go back, remember, to um, verse 21, Acts 4, 21. And it's who's going to shake you is the, is the contrast. In verse uh, verse 21 says, And when they had further threatened them, the religious authorities threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people who all were praising God for what had happened. The, the powers and the authorities of the day... They wanted to intimidate these young men into silence. And so they, they did their best. In, in our world today, we would call it bullying, right? Um, which I think is a little bit of an overused term, by the way, but uh, I won't go down that soapbox, right? But they were, they were trying to be intimidated to keep their mouths shut. They were using all of the power and authority, all of their oomph to shake Peter and John in that early church into silence. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. See, this is the contrast of powers in the world and the power of God. In your workplace, in your vocation, in your neighborhood, in your community, living out the life of Jesus is intimidating to others. And one of the responses is that people will try to shake you. They will try to intimidate you. They will try to force you through whatever power and authority that they have to shut up, to conform, to fit into the, the world mold. But what we see here in this early church is, is that they knew that there was a, a greater power that shakes Ever shaking that this little group of people was trying to do was the shaking of God and his power was the greater thing. There is a power greater than the one trying to shake you up in your life. And you can invoke that power by invoking the name of Jesus Christ Whatever situation, whatever challenge, whatever problem, whatever thing you find yourself in, the most powerful and the first and the best thing that you can do is to call on the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he will shake heaven and earth. And in that, God, I pray that we would be the unshakable ones because we stand so firmly in your grasp that we are so surrounded in your velvet steel arm 